It's like very, very much simple why this, this story will continue, why, you know, why there's going to be no secular talk for Bitcoin. There's not going to be this one final peak and then it all, you know, it's, story is great, but it all comes crumbling down. It's like, what causes this story that's been proliferating, this idea, this network that's been proliferating since 2009 to stop? That's the real question everyone should be asking because, yeah, there could be lapses in momentum and drawdowns and hiccups and speed bumps. But what's what causes this idea to stop and actually reverse? And there is no answer. And there is no good answer to that. Welcome back to the Freedom Footprint Show, the Bitcoin philosophy show with Knut Svanholm and me, Luke the Pseudofin. And our guest today is Dylan LeClaire. You might know him for his fantastic Bitcoin analysis, everything from on-chain to talking about macro situations, things like that. We, to be honest, we haven't really had someone uh, who's who's that much of an expert in this topic on the show before. So really excited to have you. Dylan, welcome to the Freedom Footprint Show. Thanks so much, guys. Yeah, I'm really happy to be here and, and happy we can make this work. Yeah, good to see you, Dylan. Last time we saw you in real life was in Riga. Uh, we tried to pull off an interview there, but uh, couldn't find the time. There's so much going on in Riga. So uh, we're doing it now instead. And uh, yeah, could you give us a, a TLDR on Dylan LeClaire and uh, also how did you find Bitcoin and what did you find so compelling about it? What's your, what's your orange pill story? Yeah, totally. Um, I've, I've gone through it a bit before, so won't make it too long winded, but essentially was, was always a math numbers guy, uh, started studying business and finance sort of topic very, very deeply uh, when I was in high school before I went to university you know, Warren Buffett style, like value investing, um, you know, compound interest, like the the basic building block concepts. Actually, you know, stumbled one of the first tough points with Bitcoin, um, other than like an ICO bubble that someone kind of in my family went through, was actually Preston's show, which is funny enough, but didn't like go full large build. You know, I, I was familiar with some of the the Bitcoin maximalists on Twitter, but wasn't like fully down the rabbit hole. And then uh, you know, I like also was very, very much familiar with like the plan B, like stock to flow model. And again, that not that it was gospel for me, but more as a math guy, it was like, I looked at a linear regression on a log scale and was like, whoa, you know, this is like, what, what is this? What's going on here? Difficulty adjustment, having all those concepts and really understanding those at a deeper level. And then COVID happened. Um, and I'm in the midst of, you know, Ray Dalio's debt cycle framework short-term debt cycle, long-term debt cycle, these kind of these long macro uh, cycles, the rise and fall of empires, the fourth turning concepts. And, you know, there's just this system, this network, this protocol that's seemingly, you know, living and breathing, dynamic, never dies, can't kill it. Um, and it just clicked. Um, so I, I left school, went all in on Bitcoin, not as, not because I had a job in the space, I didn't. And, and I tell people, it's not like it when when you get that Bitcoin moment, it's you like you really shouldn't want or like not that it's a bad thing. The Bitcoin industry is fantastic, but it's not like you need to go like be a Bitcoin marketer or be a Bitcoin like work at a Bitcoin company. It's like, no, whatever your expertise is, if you have one, if not, that's okay. We're all you know learning and building. But do that thing on a Bitcoin standard if you get it. But for me, I was I didn't have any skills. I was figuring stuff out, work manual labor for a year. Uh -huh. <laughs> just to stack stats. Um, and then through Twitter, just stumbled my way to into Bitcoin magazine as a, you know, just kind of on the back end, um, started writing a bit, did well. Twitter, some shows, then all of a sudden kind of stumbled my way into a cool role in the space of just, you know, looking at data and analytics, kind of the convergence of Bitcoin and, and macro finance. And it's cool because, you know, someone like myself, pretty young, don't like, doesn't have, you know, the traditional credentials of, uh, you know, the Wall Street path. I had no MBA. I, I don't even have a bachelor's degree, but I think it's more about the merit, the merit of your ideas, right? And so Bitcoin has obviously done very well. It's gone, you know, it's had its ups and downs, but for me, I, it's, it's less about where Bitcoin trades today, tomorrow, next week, next year, more about this overarching thesis that I have and that many of us have and share, um, that there's a huge problem in the world. The money's broken and there's really, you know, there's, you can have a solution or an idea, but Bitcoin is is basically, you know, in my opinion, in my view, the most pure form of like an engineering solution to this problem. So that's kind of what I've gone all in on um, from a career standpoint, from a social standpoint, from a reputational standpoint, and from a financial standpoint. I'm all in on that idea. And, you know, that brings us here, I guess, is, is the, the short version of it. Yeah, cool. 
this begs the question, uh, the, how, how much of a deep dive have you done into uh, Austrian economics and praxeology and that stuff? So I will say I'm familiar with all the concepts. I'm familiar with, with you know, the idea of human action and value being subjective and not uh, intrinsic. But I haven't read the the texts uh, or at least uh, some par- like parts of them, but I haven't, you know, gone down a full, uh, you know, Mises textbook or down, down that rabbit hole towards. But I'm familiar just from like, you know, the, the schools of thought of like the St. Dean, St. Pierre Richard, the Vitzines, you know, Nakamoto Institute, that whole, that whole, uh, you know, subset of, of Bitcoiners. I'm, I'm very much familiar with all of that, but yeah, could probably touch up on some of the, on some of the original texts though, admittedly. The thing I was getting at here is that they all lay out a pretty compelling case, both Mises, Rothbard and, and the Hoppe after him, uh, about how macroeconomics is uh, not really not not really a solid s- science like er, all, all of these uh economic uh, market analysis things are really just trying to apply mathematics to something that cannot really be quantified so it's like sailor says like there might be a moment where all your models are destroyed because some actor does some uh, ir- seemingly irrational thing so like how how much can you know about markets and like uh what is what is market analysis and uh, what what role does it play in in uh in this environment yeah so i actually have a a book here it's it's actually probably the opposite of what you'd think of in terms of austrian economics and i think he's a pretty terrible person but it's i, I really love the concepts here and it's alchemy of finance by george soros and it talks about like the theory of reflexivity and it's essentially like you, you know, the traditional thought model of like, okay, input output um, is flawed or of like, or like, oh, like of a efficient market is, is flawed when the, the, I, the, when something happening actually changes the likelihood of that event happening in the first place. Or like, for instance, like, let me give you a good example, someone, and this maybe isn't even the perfect example of it, but Bitcoin is as, as this idea, as this monetary asset is is you know just this this tiny little thing it's a speculative little thing in the corner of the internet worth a million bucks and once bitcoin becomes 10 million dollars or 100 million dollars the liquidity of bitcoin improves the adoption improves and the idea and maybe in everybody's mind of bitcoin actually becoming a money that could be used for global settlement and global trade becomes more likely and the technology becomes more uh, becomes becomes more efficient, becomes uh, more widely adopted. Their liquidity improves, etc. So the the reflexivity of Bitcoin's likelihood of actually pr- proliferating and becoming of the global money increases, right? And so that's that's almost a reflexive idea. But that can be applied to anything. That can be applied to equity markets. That can be applied to currencies. That can be applied to you know what whatever it may be is. Uh, and I'm not explaining it. Uh, in in the right way, but I think oftentimes like that's very much fascinating. But macroeconomics as an idea is often actually just trying to imply essentially human action or some form of central planning. And I totally recognize that. That's the flawed system we live in. A lot of this stuff, this 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 cycle sort of stuff in the in the macro world is essentially trying to predict, you know, when the the central planners or when the uh, you know government central banks are going to act. Right. And it's like this game of chicken of like, okay, when, you know, when is the tightening or the easing or the, you know, intervention coming and, you know, for what it, for what it's worth. And maybe this is, you know, maybe one of the core problems of society that Bitcoin ultimately fixes or roots out of is that, is that there are people that are, you know, worth billions, hundreds of millions, you know, untold amounts of money based on just playing these games, right. Of just numbers on a screen, right. Like I, I can just know these cycles. I can borrow a bunch of money. I can, or not even know, but like interpret, influence these cycles, borrow a bunch of money, financial engineer my way into immense amount of wealth without actually like producing anything, right? You know, so there's, there's many examples of that. So macroeconomics, like it totally is a pseudoscience. There's no, there's no, there's no, like, it's not like there's a Pythagorean theorem of like A squared plus B squared equals C squared. Like, there's not actually this, that uh, one equation or rule, right? It's just kind of the evolving you know, meshy sort of framework of ideas that kind of can be interpreted however you wish. Um, but there, there are true principles, right? There, there are things that are unavoidable. Um, you know, gravity will always apply. 
Um, so I think, you know, there is, there is some grounding in reality, but less so than I think many people, including maybe myself as a, I sometimes present it, would like to like let you believe, right? Everybody's trying to figure this fucking game out. Excuse my French. <laughs> Excuse my French on it. I, I don't mean to. Your uh, French is beautiful. Uh, but, but like, yeah, you know, it's a total, it's a total guess. It's total guesswork. No one actually has the answers. And same, same, you know, same in, in, you know, Bitcoin or whatever, right? It's like, if, oh, it's like, oh, you know, 58K is programmed, you know, it's like, well, no, it's not actually. Plan B's model is a model. Uh, it's not like, it was never gospel. Uh, it, there's nothing that just because the having happens doesn't mean number go like these things like are all of us, you know, humans tr- uh, like on a spinning rock trying to figure something out and just guessing with patchwork. It's nothing is actually, you know, you can't actually like program human action like that. Uh, but, you know, directionally, obviously, I, I agree with a lot of this stuff. Yeah, uh, this Re- all reminds me of an, uh, a recent article by Armand the Parman that I read uh, about how there are three types of Bitcoin accumulators. And uh, he categorized them into three subcategories. What, the first is miners, the second is traders, and the third is hodlers. And the, uh, the miners can, all, of course, also be hodlers if they are profitable enough to keep some of their Bitcoin. Of course, they have bills to pay. Uh, the traders just want to do this uh, analysis thing and uh, buy and sell and try try to buy low and sell high, while the ho- hodlers are uh, uh, those of us that that think that the uh, you didn't, don't need how to uh, to learn how to trade Bitcoin. You need to learn how to not trade Bitcoin. That's a better strategy. Like over time, if you look at your average trader. And your average hodler, the the hodler has outperformed the trader by orders of magnitude over the last 10 years. Like, there's no question about it. One of the best moves you could have done in the last 10 years or 12 years was to just sit on your ass and hodl your Bitcoin securely for as long as you could. Like, that outperformed almost any type of trading that anyone at did. any price right at any yeah, price at, a, any, at any price and this <laughs> I, I believe this will always be true uh, at least until hyper bitcoinization this thing uh that this mechanism so so i think that uh, like so the hodlers are obviously growing in numbers because more and more people figure out that this is a less time consuming and less risky way to get wealthy over time by just not trading the thing but hodling it so the amount of traders in uh, relation to the amount of hodlers is going down. And also, the, the, like people think that we can't see this kind of exponential growth the next 12 years. Well, we've already seen it here the first 12 years or 14 years. Uh, like uh, the um, uh, Bitcoin going from zero to, to $40,000 or something at the, time, uh, at the time of recording here. But I believe that the um, people are vastly underestimating what can ha- happen the next 12 years uh, because 93% of the Bitcoins are already mined. So we'll mine about 6% of the total supply in the next 12 years, which in comparison to the uh, first 93% is just minuscule, right? And then the, the, the final half percent will be mined over the next 100 years. So the sat squeeze is real uh, and people seem to underestimate this thing so much because, I mean, the human brain is just not wired to think in exponentials. And this is like uh, <laughs> an inverted exponential, if you will. Uh, wh- what are your thoughts around that? that like, are, are the, is, is this how it works? Like, is all we need uh, a higher percentage of hold- hodlers versus traders? Yeah, I mean, I, I think trade like so-called traders are just a natural consequence of Bitcoin monetization. Um, you know, they, it's, I mean, a lot of the trading is just a wash, you know, like it's like, it's for liquidity sake, you know, like, I guess it's, it's a good thing. I on, you know, if you want to move, a, you know, a hundred million in and out of the Bitcoin market in a day, you can, but for the average person, yeah, like it would be a different, the, the equation would be, different although still it would be negative sum given the trading fees like like on average not for an individual there's 
brilliant traders and risk managers. And obviously that's not, you know, everybody can't be a hedge fund manager as their day job. And even there's many hedge fund managers that will lose money, obviously. Uh, but if you just account for one trading fee, so let's just say this is like an oversimplification, but let's just say it's 1% on each side of the buy and sell, or like even 10 basis points, you know, 0.1%. You know, that's net negative. Or that's a, that's a, you know, a negative sum game on average, right? Because the exchange is extracting some. And then you account for Uncle Sam, right? Who doesn't, you know, if you're, if you're selling for a loss, you can obviously, you know, maybe account for some of that um, and carry over those losses, but you account for the gains. And depending on where you live, they take 20, 30, 40, 50%. Um, and then, you know, you make a bunch of money in dollar terms, but in, you know, Bitcoin terms, you have to be, masterfully skilled, manage your tax, uh, your tax burden, your cost basis, maybe you use some derivative hedging instrument to not affect your cap, your cost basis and extend, and then, you know, instead just like, you know, hedge off some risk. But then again, it's like, you're getting into all these esoteric games. You maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. So hodling is, is the best, you know, for, for most people, if you think about what the next 10 years looks like in terms of performance, well, it's, you know, it's pretty much impossible to go from, you know, to see the, the, relative performance that you saw from a buck to 40,000, um, or even a hundred to 40,000. But, um, you know, the, you know, could we see another decade of 30, 40% compound annual growth or, you know, even last like 20% and that big Bic- still the best performing asset. Um, yeah, of course you could. Um, and I think that the more you, the more you grow the, you know, as, as Bitcoin hypothetically turns from a 1 trillion or $800 billion asset today to a trillion, five trillion, ten trillion. Well, all of a sudden, the leaps and bounds from ten to a hundred trillion are less about the BTC numerator and more about the USD denominator as we accelerate this process. Um, and that's an, that's not a calculation people are are really accounting for. Um, I mean, the first part of Bitcoin's monetization was very much so just Bitcoin. Inflation is two percent. Yes, M two is going up more than that. Yes, asset prices are going up more than that. Then COVID kind of happens, and that. You know, to explode the helicopter money on corporations and individuals, QE, infinity, and you know, Bitcoin goes up a bunch, crashes, but right, it's like, wait a sec, like, yeah, Bitcoin went up a ton. It was the best performing asset, it, you know, 10x or 20x from the low of the cycle, but still, they printed a bunch of money. And so, whatever the next cycle happens, who knows? Is it diminishing? Is it not? Is it a super cycle? Is it not? Like, again, no one knows. Everybody's just guessing. But would I, would I be surprised about another 50, 60, 70 percent drawdown? Absolutely not. Humans are, you know, they're very much cyclical. Human psyche and behavior is very much cyclical, which is why we get business cycles and economic cycles and asset booms and busts and drawdowns. And so, yeah, like Bitcoin probably doesn't go up as much as it did in the previous cycles, but the amount of actual capital that's flowing in is obviously orders of magnitude larger than it's ever been. And there's not that many coins going around. I mean, you're always going to see, right? The, the idea of the hodler is a strong one and it's true. We can see it in the data. You can like, I can feel it when I talk to you, you guys on a podcast or Bitcoiners on Twitter, Noster, but we can also see it in the data. Like, yeah, like 70% of Bitcoin hasn't moved in a year. 50% of Bitcoin hasn't moved in two. There's more long-term holders than ever. You know, like 90% of coins haven't moved in three months. Like these are all like unprecedented things. Um, so as capital floods in, Naturally, the exchange rate goes up and naturally hodlers, right? Like you're not selling all your stack. I'm not going to sell. I'm you know, definitely not selling all my stack ever. But if Bitcoin goes up by an order of magnitude or never mind an order of magnitude, it goes up by 5x or 2x or 3x, right? Like maybe do I peel off 1% of my stack and tr- treat myself or get the thing I've always wanted for a decade or get my mom something nice or <laughs> whatever it is, right? Yeah, maybe, maybe with 1% or 5% of my stack. And guess what? Like we see that on average in the data when Bitcoin's price goes bonkers, the people that were in the depths of the bear market, getting their teeth smashed in, you know, down 70%, down 80% stacking, that same cohort takes a little bit off, right? And they peel a little bit off at the top and they slowly distribute a little bit. And that's in tandem with this flood of capital coming in and Bitcoin's price goes parabolic. And eventually the marginal buyer gets a little exhausted and there's so much leverage built up in the system and it kind of bursts. And we see, you know, that 30, 40, 50% waterfall, 
watershed moment and, you know, Bitcoin's dead again. And we repeat it all over again. Right. And that's when the new group of hodlers that are saying, whoa, you know, that came in in 2024, 2025, like 2023, you go, whoa, this Bitcoin thing's really important. And it, and it goes up a bunch on them and they're like, wait, it's more important than I even thought. And all of a sudden it blows up in their face and they spend two years, you know, two, three years accumulating. Like, and I think we very much see this cycle. We've seen the cycle repeat over and over again. And every single time Bitcoin is more entrenched, it's more liquid, it's bigger of an idea. And uh, the, the hodler base around the world is more of a powerful, not political party, if you will, but more of a powerful kind of decentralized global unit of like autonomous sovereign individuals, right? They're saying like, hey, like, treat me right. Uh, if you don't treat me right, I'm going to take my capital elsewhere. I'm going to I'm going to move elsewhere. I'm going to relocate, and that has you know very powerful uh, you know that is that is the second and third order effects of that kind of in like ten, in tandem with this like sovereign individual thesis is very powerful on a long time frame, right? Especially as as you know Bitcoin continues to appreciate just because of supply. Like it's very simple, right? Like like you know we can over explain it as much as possible to whoever, but all it takes is a simple supply demand chart, you know, that you saw in like freshman year economics in high school, right? It's like very, very much simple why this, the story will continue. Why, you know, why there's going to be no secular talk for Bitcoin. There's not going to be this one final peak. And then it all, you know, is story is great, but it all comes crumbling down. It's like, what, what causes this story that's been proliferating this, this idea, this network that's been proliferating since 2009 to stop. That's the real question everyone should be asking um, because, yeah, there could be lapses in momentum and drawdowns and hiccups and speed bumps. But what's what causes this idea to stop and actually reverse? And there is no answer. Uh, and there is no good answer to that. No, uh, but but on that note, and this uh, all... all uh... History rhyming, but not repeating sort of kind of we go in cycles and uh, you have a bull market every now and then every four years or something. It sort of coincides with the halving somehow and uh, all of that stuff. Like there eventually comes a point where the last bull market happens. And I don't mean that in uh, the sense of uh, Bitcoin crashes and goes away, but the other thing happens like uh, people may learn slowly and we may have like tens Seven of uh, right. these bull bear cycles to, to to play out before this actually happens but eventually if this thing works and if people get it there will come a point where we're in the last bull market that just goes absolutely bonkers it's not numbers number go up anymore it's number go absolutely crazy and in this bull market all the wealth of the world flows into Bitcoin and there's no stopping it. Like, is that the way you see things too? That that point is inevitable at some point as long as this thing just keeps on working? Yeah, I, I see it like that. But I think there's going to be more of a, a back and forth fight, if you will. Uh, not in the sense of a fight as, uh, you know, Elizabeth Warren introduces some BS regulation or, or, you know, bill into Congress. But more so if, if you think about, you know, like crappy currencies have existed against the dollar and gold for a long time. Right. And they, and they you know, like the Argentinian peso continues to devalue every single year against the dollar. And it still exists. Right. And exists because of political mandate and fiat, of course, you know, and the, the arms of the state and enforcing it your taxes to be paid in et cetera. But right, like the, there's long dated fiat liabilities 30 years out, right? So, you know, even longer than that, if you're thinking of pensions, entitlements, you know, yada, yada. So I think it's very likely, um, and, you know, may, hopefully not, maybe not, um, if we're thinking about, you know, how, how this thing can go exponential and how technologies, you know, uh, adopted. And, you know, maybe I'm the guy that's saying, hey, just maybe like, you know, the horse and buggy or the, uh, <laughs> like, or some, some other sort of like, you know, tech analogy like that is still around and relevant, at, you know, 10, 15 years out, 20 years out. But I think there's, there's a, a world where Bitcoin is the dominant unit of or the dominant global settlement rail. It's the dominant store of value. It's 10 times larger than gold. And the dollar could still exist as a form of, you know, 
a form of currency, if you will, as a form of basically just the last arm of, of government. And, and it imposes actually a fiscal austerity and a fiscal form of, uh, maybe not austerity, but a, a form of, uh, you know, sensibility, um, austerity, um, you know, just more, more so just kind of, it, it pulls everyone back a little bit and says, okay, wait, we actually have to be cognizant of, of this whole path. And so in the same way that you see like in emerging markets, they'll jack up interest rates a ton to defend their currency against speculators. Well, you know, people don't like to think of that, but like Michael Saylor is the most pure example of this. When you think of like, okay, he's going to borrow a billion dollars of, you know, convert, he's borrowing a billion dollars convertible notes at zero, right? And he's giving people an option to sell equity uh, or just you know, borrowing at zero, paying seven years later. And then he borrows 600 million in the junk debt market at 6%. Well, you know, at a micro scale, right? Like, let's just say, and I don't, but let's just say I have, I have a hundred thousand of student debt. I don't, I took one year of school, had good grades, have no debt, but let's just say I was the typical zoomer, right? And at a hundred thousand or whatever of, of unsecured student debt that I can't default upon at 4% interest or 5% interest or whatever it was, because it was a few years back. Well, you know, I'm an, I'm someone that thinks for the long term. I instead of paying down, you know, my student debt, I make the decision that, you know, that my 60 year old financial advisor may say is risky. But I instead of paying that all down in principle, pay the interest, pay a small amount of principle, but I'm stacking Bitcoin, right? I'm stacking Bitcoin, putting Bitcoin away, stacking for cold storage. Well, am I borrowing money to buy Bitcoin? No, but instead of borrowing that, instead of paying that debt off. I'm, aside, I'm, I'm deciding and instead of eliminating the liability on, the, on my side of the, on the liability side of my balance sheet, I'm acquiring a Bitcoin denominated asset on the asset side. So indirectly, right, like dollars on my personal balance sheet are fungible, right? I understand, right, like if you have a mortgage per se and you don't pay that fully off and you buy some Bitcoin while still having that mortgage, you're not borrowing money to buy Bitcoin. But instead of assisting, like extinguishing that liability or acquiring the Bitcoin denominated asset, in a way, that's if you think of you know your personal balance sheet as fungible, you're borrowing money to buy Bitcoin, right? Instead of it's the, you're you're deferring, you're paying interest on that, and you're acquiring the Bitcoin denominated asset. So all of us, any of us that have Bitcoin and debt, are acquiring the Bitcoin asset and ignoring the dollar liability, and that at a societal scale, um, as this thing continues to, as this economic system continues to you know require perpetual credit expansion. As these historic debt levels continue to require financial repression, you know, inflation above interest rates, because that's the reality. I mean, the last the last year aside, they're going through this tightening cycle. Everybody's thinking all is well, but it's it's unmanageable. So they need more inflation. They need more units in the system. It's just a fact. It's just a math. It's a math equation. It's not even a macro equation. It's a math equation. Like you you have to inflate away the currency. And so from from you know this, if you're thinking about how the dollar. I, and I would say the dollar is the strongest, obviously, of all the other currencies, the euro, the yen, the, the yuan, the ruble, whatever currency you want. Um, but they can very much exist. Uh, but they'll be, you know, if not like not to say worthless, but near worthless on a year over year basis forever. Right. Uh, and there will be volatility, of course, as these, you know, these dying systems kind of fight back in the form of interest rate. Rate, like rate, and everybody knows that the rate rate uh, hikes aren't sustainable. Like every tightening cycle, we we go through this. Like they raise they raise rates. It's like okay, all is good, and then boom, something something breaks. Right? Like tech bubble, yeah, eighty percent drawdown, fifty percent drawdown in the equity indices. Not even like not even big tech, fifty percent drawdown in the S and P five hundred when they raise rates in the tech bubble. But like okay, shoot, how do you fix this? They literally said the Fed Greenspan's like we should blow a housing bubble. This is in the Fed minutes. This is what they were saying in like 2002, 2003. Housing market comes, they raise, they raise rates because inflation starts to roar, or oil's going bonkers. Boom, leverage collapse, you know, great financial crisis, once in a hundred year catastrophe, they cut rates to zero. They get rates up to two and a half percent in 2018, 2019 for the corporate bond markets. Like, oh boy, we have a big problem. 2019, they're already cutting rates. Repo market blows up. They start expanding the balance sheet before COVID. BlackRock's like, hey, next down cycle, we need to go direct from governments to households with stimulus because we've done a decade of rates at zero. 
And when rates are at zero again, we're not going to have, they're not going to have any sort of leverage. We're not going to have any sort of like oomph for our easing. So we're going to need to go direct to households. Six months later, COVID, $10 trillion in the system. So like this, this reality that yes, there, there, there needs to be perpetual credit expansion. Yes, the dollar is going to continue to devalue against everything you care about. True. But there's always going to be, I think, and as Bitcoin becomes more valuable, it's going to play a bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger role and more directly represent the, the devaluation in fiat and the devaluation of the dollar more purely, I think, in my view, right? Instead of just being this uncorrelated thing that's just booming and busting, when Bitcoin's a $10 trillion asset, when Bitcoin's a $50 trillion asset, hypothetically, we're in, we're in this world, it's going to tick for tick match the market's expectation and the actual dollar devaluation in the system. And that's, and that's what you can expect, right? It's going to be this pure gauge of, of calling, calling the, the system's bluffs, if you will, right? It's like, oh, you want to, you want to print a trillion dollars for this BS stimulus plan? Great. Bitcoin gaps up 10% on the news, right? Like that's, that's the game that's, that's playing. And I think, you know, the question of like, is dollar going to collapse tomorrow? Like, you know, I don't, or not tomorrow, but like in this decade, like, yeah, in purchasing power terms, of course it will against Bitcoin. Um, but. I think the dollar can still exist with Bitcoin uh, and the Bitcoin to be worth a hundred trillion and it can still exist. And like, that's, if, if that's not something I'm rooting for or not, I think it's just the reality that like we can all, you know, at some point, yeah, it'll be gone. Um, but like, what's the path to get there? How long does it take? Uh, that's anybody's guess. Yeah. That's the, that's the trickiest question, right? Uh, with all of this is the timing of the stuff. But the, the facts are still there. Everything drops to their marginal cost of production. And the marginal cost of production of a dollar is zero. Like it's it's literally, uh, it costs you nothing to, to print a dollar if you have a money printer. Like, and it, uh, that is not the case with Bitcoin. The marginal cost of a Bitcoin goes higher and higher every year. So that's it. All right. You might have noticed that we've recently partnered with Amber App. After our episode with Izzy, their CEO and our close friend, we knew we would have to partner with them in some way. If you haven't seen our episode with Izzy, definitely go check it out. You'll see why it's such a great fit. And honestly, they're following the orange glowing light like Izzy always says. And that's exactly what we try to do here at the Freedom Footprint Show. The big news about Amber App is that they're going to be launching their version 2.0. I've seen some of the screenshots and it looks fantastic. They're going to be including a non-custodial on-chain wallet, an anonymous lightning wallet, a fiat wallet, and finally, it's going to be an exchange, of course. It's going to be just this super app. They're also going to be launching globally. Everyone's going to be able to use it. We're really excited about all that. Stay tuned with us and you'll hear all about it. And for now, check out their website, amber.app, and the episode with Izzy to find out more. Next up, Wasabi Wallet, the privacy by default open source, non-custodial Bitcoin wallet with CoinJoin built in. It's the easy to use, comprehensive, affordable way to make your coins private. And the best part is they've been making huge improvements to the app. They're really focusing on the user experience, adding advanced features for power users. They just keep getting better. You send your coins to your Wasabi wallet and they get combined with loads of other coins using the Wabi Sabi protocol. So they're private on the other end. Your tracks are covered, so you can work on expanding your freedom footprint without worrying about your privacy. So check out wasabiwallet.io and download Wasabi today. If we extrapolate into the future for a while here and, and try to explore what's, what's the role of uh, macroeconomics in a hyper-Bitcoinized world, if we, if we just take that for a fact that everyone on Earth uses Bitcoin as their main medium of exchange, is there such a thing as a hedge fund in, in such a future? Is there a need for a financial sector at all? Or what is a company in such a future? Like, I'm, I'm trying to imagine this. If, if, if there's no interventionism anymore, so you don't have, uh, say, ju just imagine this fictitious scenario where you have no inflation, no taxes, or little to no taxes or they're mostly voluntary. So a company is really just a telegram group and we're all on a Bitcoin standard and we can all trade gro globally. Is there even a need for a financial sector in, in such a world? Yeah, you know, the idea of macroeconomics and, you know, this whole 
you know, reading tea leaf financial sector is, is very much gone or greatly diminished uh, when the money is an apolitical, uh, you know, neutral programmatic network. Um, and I agree there. Uh, but I, I think that, the, you know, when you think of the financial sector, um, it's you, you eliminate the cotillionaires, you eliminate the, the idea of those being closest to the money printer kind of uh, benefiting at the cost of everybody else just yeah, the based can- on having... the cancel on effect. Yeah, exactly. You eliminate that, but I think the financial sector in the form of... Right, so like the last question you asked, like, is the dollar... And you did say this exactly, but you're like, is the dollar going away entirely? And I didn't push back, but, you know, maybe offered a, a bit of uh, a different view saying, hey, maybe it doesn't just go away entirely. And, and they, the two exist in parallel for a lot longer than most of us believe, including myself, you know, a couple of years ago, maybe I wouldn't believe I'm saying this, but here, just here's an idea, right? Like, if you look at the, the, like, whether it's the most unbelievable hyperinflationary event or it, you know the dollar just steadily devalues three four five percent a year bitcoin goes up ten percent compound annual growth for a long long time right it could be like you know or any of the kind of scenarios you, you assign right um what what do you do in a world where the currency is manipulated and devaluing and probably interest rate below the rate of inflation like what do you what do you do in that world well, I would say, and if you like study like the hyperinflations or the high inflations, the people that got the richest and not that like your goal should be to get rich or not, but I guess maybe the people that preserve their purchasing power, one of the things they do is they borrow in the weak currency, right? Long be it liabilities, whatever it may be, however they may be doing it and acquiring hard assets. Like one of the richest guys in Germany, like Hugo Steiner's in, in Weimar was he was borrowing in the, in the German mark and acquiring industry and acquiring gold and speculating, right? So it's it's like, well, what's the need for financial services? And it's like, okay, let's just look at the Bitcoin companies, you know, and chain swans, you know, blah 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 blah. Um, what well, like, and I say just those two because they have dollar lending uh, facilities where you can post your Bitcoin, and people say, oh, well, you know, borrow against your Bitcoin leverage. That's super risky. And it's like, yeah, we'll evaluate your own risks. But the fact is, and I don't think people understand this, Unchained has had, and Swan, I think, just recently launched theirs, Unchained has had a dollar lending facility against Bitcoin since 2017. And the interest rate's high. Yeah, it is. Um, So if you can get, you know, a cheap cost of capital elsewhere without collateralizing your Bitcoin, fantastic. Great for you. Um, But the reality is this world doesn't require, I don't need a credit score. I I give you two dollars. I give you twenty bucks of Bitcoin, or twenty five bucks of Bitcoin, or whatever it is. And I, depending on how much I give you, uh, it affects the rate I get, right? In, in hypothetically, in this world, but I borrow ten dollars based on my twenty bucks of Bitcoin, or let's just do it in Bitcoin terms. I give you two Bitcoin, forty thousand dollars pop, and I borrow forty thousand dollars, right? That world, that system, Unchained has never seen a loan default. Their loan book is 100%. They've never seen a default. How? How is that? That's like unbelievable in the world of Lexi Finance. The recovery profile is 100% and it takes two minutes, right? What's the recovery profile on, on subprime auto loans? What's the recovery profile on commercial real estate, right? There's, there's not, there, there's nothing like this exists where I can liquidate you in an orderly manner. But before that, I can say, hey, do you have more collateral to post? Hey, can you pay some down? Hey, Bitcoin's exchange rate dropped, right? So in a world where the dollar still is around, yeah, financial services will exist, right? Hey, I have a bunch of Bitcoin because I've been accumulating for years. I would like to buy some Apple stock or I would like to buy some micro strategy stock, but I don't want to sell my Bitcoin because I don't want to pay taxes um, and I don't want to, or I just don't want to relinquish with my HODL, right? It's like, okay, well, hey, put some Bitcoin in the brokerage account you can borrow against and you can buy some Apple stock. Right. That's, that's something that I would find valuable. Um, and so financial services absolutely will exist. Um, just yesterday, two days ago, I think a week ago, and I posted about it and I kind of, uh, was, was bearish on it. But Sam Altman, right. Who, uh, you know, open, open AI CEO got ousted, came back famously, uh, is the, the world coin, you know, dysto- world coin, very dystopian idea. Uh, is like one of the co-founders there, uh, but just recently announced a you know, $100 million 
private Bitcoin credit fund. It's like, okay, what does that mean? And it's basically what Genesis and a bunch of the Bitcoin uh, yield companies were doing a while ago, right? Where they're looking to get Bitcoin denominated yields. And they're going to be taking directional risk to do that, of course. And it will, well, I said, likely to blow up by 2026. And it was kind of tongue in cheek, kind of satire, but also serious, right? Because the risk-free rate of Bitcoin is zero. But again, right? In a world where there is no, there is no risk-free rate, there is no Fed funds set by a board of, you know, 12, 12 men in a, in a room, right? Well, then, then you're free to do whatever you, you, you may choose. Uh, in that world, you're, you're free to go to a financial service company and borrow and get dollars. You're free to, you're free to, you know, directionally chase yield. And it's not yield in the same way that like there's risk in investing in junk bonds today, right? If I want to get 10% yield, I can buy like IBM bonds, but they might default, right? So like, I think financial services will absolutely exist. It's just about the, the, the bedrock or the, you know, structure it's built upon. Uh, it's not built upon, and there will, there'll be many failures and there'll be many collapses and there will be many fractional reserve operations that all collapse. And F, uh, FTX collapsed and all the Bitcoiners, I went to Pacific Bitcoin, November, 2022, two days after FTX collapsed. And it was the most happy, not happy in the, in the form like FTX collapsed, like, like, Hey, let's party, but no one cared. Everybody was bullish. Everybody was, was super optimistic about the future. And then I talked with some of my, you know, crypto friends and, and was talking to those people in those circles. And they're like, and even the macro people that I also am in the same room with, um, and, and I talked to frequently and the sentiment was like, it's over, man. And it's so over, like it's done. There was a good run. You know, we tried it crypto. It was great, but like backed it up, go home. I was like, what? Like, <laughs> do you guys, are you guys like seeing the same thing I'm seeing? Like, this is a. The guy was a fraud. Like, like this is great that we got him out of here. Um, and so I think that we'll see that story repeat over and over again. Uh, but the, the, the need for like quality financial services, right? Uh, like, especially in a world where the dollar exists, right? In a world where the dollar exists, then I don't ever want to sell my Bitcoin because I'm going to have to pay capital gains taxes. And like, I, I'm a US citizen. So I pay tax no matter where I live anywhere on the globe. Uh, and uh, and to escape that, I have to relinquish my citizenship. So, yeah, do I want to do that? No, I don't want to do that. Maybe will I want to do that in the future? Sure, but like I'm going to pay my taxes because I don't want to go in prison, right? Obviously, um, as should, would any logical, rational person. So in that world, like I don't have interest in selling my Bitcoin. I'm just gonna, if I need to borrow against it and invest it, right? But in a world where Bitcoin's needed doesn't count, then like sure, and and there is no dollar, then like sure. And it's legal tender. Like I'll invest Bitcoin uh, into the stock market to acquire Bitcoin denominated returns, or I'll invest in a you know, Bitcoin value fund, or I'll put you know I'll buy a laundromat to cash flow in Bitcoin terms, right? Like <laughs> you know, th it's just that world right now. And I thought deeply about this. You know, I the intelligent investor by Warren Buffett back there. Like the value investing world, the, like why is value underperformed for two decades? And like some of the smartest people in macro and and investing don't get it. They're like, like, you know, like Warren Buffett, like he's, he's done well just because he, you know, put punted Apple with massive size 10 years after Apple had already won. Right. And he's made, he's made boatloads of money. But besides that, like value is deeply, deeply, deeply underperformed for two decades. And, you know, I would post that, Hey, maybe like your, your ruler keeps changing. Like you're, you're saying like, Hey, this is, this is valuable. This is, this is a good use of my capital. And you continue to underperform the people that just punt NASDAQ at any price. It's like, hmm. you know, well, I wonder what could be the cause of that. And, and the exciting thing for me is that value investing, you know, real finance, economics, real economic calculation returns in a world where, where the money is, isn't broken. Um, so that was a long winded, I kind of threw a lot at you there, but I think that's, that's what I'm thinking about. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't believe that, uh, financial services nor the dollar will go away anytime soon. I'm just trying to like, I'm fishing for what happens after that, because that's, that's the part that I find interesting to like that. I, it's my 
hobby to think about, like what what happens after hyper Bitcoinization. And speaking of uh, Buffett and Munger, just on a side note here, uh, I read an interesting theory about them that they're they the reason that they were so against Bitcoin is because they're they, they might not be a, might not have been as ignorant as we thought. They might totally understand it. It's just that the current system plays into their hands very much. Like the dollar is beneficial to them. They're they're on the receiving end uh, of that, you know, uh, wealth distribution from the poor to the rich. So uh, yeah. What I think, yeah, I, I think the financial sector will uh, be reduced to what's absolutely necessary at some point. But uh, but I'm curious as why well, uh, about these long term, like the the things you explain, they're they're very like to me, it's it's very sound and it's things that uh, people should be aware of and they should prepare for what's coming and stuff. What's happening, like in a near to midterm future. The show is also sponsored by Orange Mill app, the Bitcoin only social network where you can stack friends who stack sats. You can connect with your favorite Bitcoiners on the app, make local connections, and even connect with Bitcoiners around the world. You can see what's going on in your local area and connect with Bitcoiners around you. I've been to multiple events organized on Orange Mill app and they brought Bitcoiners together from all over. And now with group chat, it's easier than ever to stay in touch with all of your Bitcoin friends. The best part is that you know it's high signal. There's no spam on Orange Pill app because everyone pays to be there. So download Orange Pill app on Apple or Android, send me or Canoe to DM, and start building your local network of Bitcoiners today. Next up, the Bitcoin way. Their mission is to onboard, educate, and remove barriers to taking self-custody of your Bitcoin. They cover everything from cold wallets to nodes, no KYC Bitcoin purchases, inheritance planning, payments, and more. Whether you're new to Bitcoin or you're an experienced Bitcoiner looking to expand your freedom footprint, or you know someone who this sounds perfect for, the Bitcoin Way has something for you. They have a skilled team, well-versed in the Bitcoin space, and their goal is to make all the complexities of Bitcoin as straightforward as possible for everyone. And the best part is you can get started with a free 30-minute call with their team. Go to thebitcoinway.com contact for more info. Our newest sponsor is Geyser. They are the portal to the creator economy on Bitcoin. On Geyser, creators can monetize their work through their communities in a social and engaging way, and supporters can send sats to their favorite projects. Geyser has also recently integrated with Zaps and Podcasting 2.0, so every Zap sent to a Geyser address shows up on the Geyser page. We have a Geyser fund ourselves. It's the best way to support our show directly with Bitcoin. So whether you're a creator or a supporter, check out Geyser at geyser.fund today but like i'm just curious uh what do you think uh has the most long longevity or like what do you think disappears first the us the uk the eu or china which one has the 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 uh longest survival rate right let's throw el, el salvador in there for uh <laughs> because why not i mean i would say probably uh in China or the EU in the sense of, um, and, and by the EU, I don't mean like societal collapse. I mean, I, I actually like would, as the, um, you know, a bit of, especially the last 12 months have become like more of a history buff than I was previously. And I still need to touch up a whole lot of stuff, but I spent the last couple of years traveling a little bit around Europe and the unique culture, uh, and the language and the deep history and all these places is super, super fascinating. The architecture is beautiful. I mean, you know, uh, I, I lived somewhat for most of my life in a very much American bubble. Um, so seeing Europe was like very much uh, just, you know, eye opening. Um, so, you know, the European Union will persist and thrive regardless of the demographics and all of this, you know, sort of stuff without the EU, you know, 100%, without this, you know, sprawling bureaucracy of, you know, um, kind of project managers that are trying to take away everybody's rights and freedoms. Um, so yeah, I mean, I would, I would very much like to see that, uh, return, you know, sovereignty return to the individual nations in the, in the European. Yeah. Union. Yeah. But, but okay. Okay. Let, let me stop you right there because like, yeah, I think Europe as a concept has a very long survival rate, but, but I'm talking more about these institutions like the U S government and the EU and the, the CCP, if you will, like, 
these bureaucratic and ent- like entities that we call nations. <laughs> Which one dies first? I don't think it's the U.S. Um, I I mean, they're uh, you know the U.S. is obviously very very powerful. Um, I think just the the, the structure of, of state rights under kind of one union is a little bit as a is a, is a great system. Obviously, I mean, like the U.S. Yeah, we we do have a billion guns, so any any sort of over uh, you know the government oversteps you, there is that ultimate backstop. Um, the CCP has, you know, this, obviously this digital panopticon surveillance state that's highly technical. Um, and it is kind of built on the backs of, uh, you know, industrialization and never, ever, bur- uh, you know, ever expanding debt burdens. Um, and so, you know, who could have like, who would have thought the Soviet union would have collapsed, you know, in the height of the cold war, you know, I've said Hey, the Soviet Union is going to collapse in fifteen years or ten years or seven years. Like, who would have believed that? No, that, like, uh, if I may interrupt you there, Dylan, because this is sort of why I asked the question. Because I lived through that, and I lived in a, a quote unquote neutral country. So, so uh, my entire upbringing, I was uh, taught in public school that the the U.S. the the U.S. and the Soviet that like that's the Cold War. You have this balance of power between capitalism and socialism. And uh, the way we were taught in schools, it was like these these were two different systems, but they're sort of equal in terms of worth. Like So, so this system is just as sustainable as the other, and uh, we'll, we'll see what happens, but they're sort of equal. And that's what everyone thought over uh, back in Sweden in the 80s. So, so no one saw the the fall of the Soviet coming, and and uh, like that's why I'm so so fascinated about this because I don't I don't think anyone ever predicts empires falling. Like in hindsight, it was obvious because the Soviet Union was basically just a giant prison for seventy years, and people were starving and not doing shit. So, oh, it, it had to collapse at some point because it was unsustainable. Like totalitarianism doesn't work in the long run. Uh, but I, I think it's a little harder to predict with the, the powers that be today because we're like here in Europe, it's sort of like the East is the new West because the, the, the former Soviet states are much more inclined to, to, uh, you know, n- not doing what they're told and to disobey whatever the government says. While, whilst in the West, uh, in Western Europe, everyone was putting on masks and uh, taking booster shots as soon as anything was said about that thing. Like, uh, it's like, bah, bah, of course, virtue, virtue. Uh, so, so I think the West is on the same path as the East used to be, and the East is on the same path as the West used to be. So there's some pendulum effect going on over here. No, I, I, that's a great point. Um, and I mean, obviously, uh, you know, being under communist rule will will do that to you. Uh, the collectivism in the West is is worrisome. Obviously, I I, un- I understand it and sympathize with it. I obviously am, I'm very much against it uh, and allocate all of my time and capital to not to insulating myself from it. Obviously, um, but you know, some of these these macro you know uh, forces, societal forces, are much too large for an individual to overcome or change completely. We're kind of um, at the whims of, of these shifts uh, is obviously, but I mean, if I think of like, obviously that communism as an idea uh, and how it's presented and how you view it, you know, like how the media presents it is obviously, it seems much more stable than it actually is. Um, so that's one thing. And I think, you know, so like that would probably be very much bearish on, on China as this, as this project, uh, you know, we see all like, what is it that the ghost cities, right? These, these things that were constructed and, and, you know, the GDP number go up, right. When really like nothing of long-term value is, is, is produced. Um, but I am a little bearish, um, and I don't have, you know, a catalyst per se, or one event or even a timeline, but the Euro as an idea, right? Like everybody's like, oh, Bitcoin's this experiment. It's like, no, well, yeah, I'm sure it is. But so is the Euro. Like, <laughs> like. The euro taking all these sovereignties. I don't even know how many countries is it like. What is it? Fifteen, nineteen? Absolutely. How many countries are using the euro? Um, and you know, I think I just went to Croatia for a month 
Uh, I was in split Croatia for a month in, in October, and they just recently started using the euro. Um, but you have this model where it's different demographics, you know, uh, and and the productivity of these states like, you know, the Italy and, and Spain and Greece and Portugal um, are kind of these tourist hubs with not great demographics, while Germany is is subsidizing everybody, but also this manufacturing hub um, that's, you know, benefiting because of the the weaker currency uh, than would otherwise exist in a manufacturing hub like Germany. And obviously, you know, the Russia, Ukraine war, the natural gas, like, so I, I see the euro and the ECB structure splintering a bit. And I think eventually uh, a lot of these nations um, realize or, you know, I think there's going to be a lot of populist uh, sort of far right, if you will, tides. Um, Brexit, Brexit type things. Yeah, I think it's, it's it's a natural. I mean, this is a bit more political than just, you know, economic or even ph philosophical. But, you know, the, the nationalist um, kind of like right rising um is is a natural reaction it's a natural immune response and not that it's you know but but like pushing unfettered immigration and these these you know overarching demographic changes and and you know basically like labeling anybody that doesn't like say like yeah you know this is obviously great uh ch you know changing like hundreds of years of of history culture um like calling anybody a, a bigot that doesn't want this stuff, you know, or labeling them as like far right extremism, not just in Europe and, and the US, but like, it's obviously a different story. Um, the details, uh, this yeah, is obviously but it's like, similar. it's, it's very much similar. It's happening, it's happening everywhere. Right. Um, and it, and it results and it's manifesting in different ways. But I think you see that this decade, especially, and this is, I mean, this is yeah, what you the, see. The backlash, backlash is all we're already here. I mean, <laughs> It, and it's connected to all of this stuff, like woke Disney and the the MCU and all of this stuff. It's also getting its long overdue backlash now. And uh, so, so all of this woke stuff and uh, calling calling anyone who doesn't agree a a, a Nazi, it, it's getting its overdue backlash. Yes. Yeah, well, I, I think we we very much agree there, and it's it's more so just like the pendulum always swings back. Um, so yeah, when you when you try to push people, the populists, you know, the tide of what's considered mainstream or the Overton window, or you know, uh, this far left, or even you know, this far right, but you know, you push the pendulum one way, you know, there is an, an equal reaction on the other side of that. And I think that's what we're seeing. Um, we're starting to see so. Uh, you know, that, what does that lead to? Does that lead to the splintering of an EU? Does that lead to the splintering of a Euro as a construct? Like, again, who knows? And none of this happens next month or next year. All right. Like, but it's, it's a slow, it's a slow process, but it's a gradually then suddenly process, I think. Um, and you know, we're in one of those time periods, like there's, there's decades where nothing happens and, uh, or I, there's a saying there, um, there's there's decades where years happen, or I don't even know what to say. But we're in the we're in the years where decades happen now. Um, yeah, yeah. And you know, certainly we're we're living in interesting times. Um, and so, yeah, and a lot of this I think is very much intertwined with these, uh, you know, these debt cycles, right? These eighty year debt super cycles. These these, uh, you know, the rise and fall of these powers, right? I I think everything's very much intertwined and connected. Um, and the West. Uh, as this global hegemon uh, is obviously still, you know, the U.S. and the West broadly, NATO is obviously still the power at large. But if you just rewind to 20 years ago, right, or like let's just say post post collapse of the Soviet Union, 1990s, right, the U.S. and I guess just the West broadly was the the largest absolute and relative hegemon the world has ever seen in recorded history, from a political, military, technological um standpoint financial there never there's there had never been uh a, a, a larger relative or absolute power in the history of the world um and that that hasn't crumbled far from it but that relative power has shifted right where we're 30, 20 30 years ago you couldn't you, i guess like 25 years ago you couldn't have imagined a nation or a coalition of nations you know, not really like kind of laughing or, or like, you know, turning away from the U S right. 
or, or, you know, like OPEC and Russia, right? Like coming together and, and, and talking oil while the U S isn't in the conversation like that is, 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 you know, unimaginable or trading in yuan, like these sort of things. Right. Um, and that happening kind of tells you like, not the state of things, not that collapse is like absolutely imminent, but more so that the, the power you know, underneath the surface has been relatively, relatively shifting. Right. And so, you know, what, what results of this, like culturally, mil- militarily, financially, right. These are like huge, huge questions, but I think, you know, a lot of this coming to the head at the same time, like is certainly not a coincidence. No. Uh, you said uh, a thing about, you know, Germany is subsidizing the pigs countries. Uh, th- this is the, the, there's a funny way to look at that. And that is, uh, you know, Germany makes all this money from making Mercedes's and BMWs and whatnot and Audis and selling them to the, to Italy, Spain, Portugal, <laughs> Greece. Uh, uh, it's just the, the, the problem is just that these countries can't afford them really so they take on a lot of debt and then germany has to bail them out so what's really going on is that they're getting the bmws at a discount uh <laughs> through uh through a a, a a giant maze of bureaucracy but that's what's really going on so as you're redistributing resources so the Germans think that they get well paid for their bmws but in reality they don't because they have to pay the debts and yeah, now they have other debts to pay as well uh, as we move into the next decade. But that that's another story for another time. The the European economic model is is always fascinating to look at, and it's always I, I, every once in a while I catch myself, uh, you know, whether I'm in the debate myself or uh, you know just reading third party commentary of like someone comparing like uh, the economic model of like you know a Scandinavian nation with the U.S. and they're like. But they look at their healthcare, or like look at their, look at their, you know, m- look at their murder rate, or like, and I'm just like, oh, you know, you're comparing a, a small homogenous nation, you know, a, a, in the European Union of six six million people uh, to this sprawling land mass of 360 million uh, yeah, individuals. Yeah, yeah, okay. It's like, it's just a, <laughs> it's always it's always an interesting convo um, where that leads. But uh, yeah, no, I I agree. And if if Sweden was a state in the U.S., we would be in the top uh, in the bottom five states in terms of GDP. So so there's that. And uh, also, like, like other interesting facts, uh, Democrats promote this uh, Scandinavian model to be so, so like a role model for the rest of the world. But the thing is, in Sweden, who has where the model sort of comes from. Uh, 49 of the 50 biggest companies were founded before this whole thing started. So the the models have not done nothing but, you know, extract the wealth that was already there and s- sort of put all the countries on the wrong path. Uh, so uh, it's c- really kind of depressing that it's getting promoted as something that it isn't because it's just uh, a giant cost in the, at the end of the day. I mean, and not to mention, like, and this is a much larger combo, but the the whole European economic model is, you know, uh, that's like like NATO, like the U.S. provides their security budget. So it's like, if you know, it's like, oh, you know, why don't they have free? Wait, why don't they get free healthcare? It's like, oh, well, you know, the deal is the U.S. is the world's policeman, big brother, and. uh you know, so <laughs> all these European nations can have, you know, this or that. And, uh, you know, without the, if they had to provide their own military and they had to, you know, secure their own trade routes, like this looks like a different nation, obviously, uh, but that's never in the discussion. Then again, a big part of the relative success of the U.S. compared to every other nation state is just the <laughs> the fact that you went off the gold standard in 71 and therefore you can print things out of thin air and pay for everything like <laughs> give me your resources and i'll give you this fictitious shit like that's the success story there and uh, yeah i think it's depressing maybe to take us in a slightly different direction here talking about things collapsing and and all this 
uh, is there an optimistic angle here? Do you do you have hope for what Bitcoin can do for the world? What's what's your view on that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I I think it's. Um, I mean, I tweeted this yesterday and have already mentioned the sovereign individual. Um, you know, a couple of times today, but I, I believe Bitcoin as this as this piece of uh, you know property uh, or um, this this asset that you know, completely returns the property rights to you the individual is a great forcing function for um for for governments and and you know peaceful cooperation everywhere right if if coercion is is via technology removed from the you know bargaining table right this changes this changes the power dynamic everywhere it 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 changes the the logic of violence if you will right like you think about like every war like yeah the tanks were all then they come and take your gold right but if, if I, if, if you come up to me with a gun and say, I'm going to kill you, give me your money. And I say, kill me. You're not having my money. Right. Like that, that changes things. Um, and that, and that's never been, that's never, that's never existed ever. And so I present this to you as, you know, sort of a radical, uh, individual, uh, example. Right. But this is, you can extrapolate this at large. Um, and so, you know, never mind that, like, but also, you know, what Bitcoin does with, with regards to, you know, the energy grid um, and, and global energy systems at large, um, kind of chasing this like Kardashev uh, sort of civilization where all energy is used as efficiently and effectively as possible. Um, you know, this sort of broader idea of, of, you know, human flourishing is a derivative of our ability to harness uh, and capture energy efficiently, right? Like, you know, say, you know, say what you will about the industrial revolution and its uh, consequences on the human race. But, <laughs> um, but it's, you know, if you think about living standards, quality of life, um, you know, the average life expectancy, like if you're pro humanity, you know, you have to just accept as a fact empirically that energy, you know, uh, you know producing and utilizing energy um, in any form, um, you know, fossil fuels or, or not. Um, is a good thing for humanity, right? It's, it's raised our living standards. Um, and, you know, unless you're a Malthusian, then you, you can agree with that and say that that's good. And so an, an energy money, an energy currency, a, a direct incentive to monetize all waste energy on the world. Every, every you know, cubic foot of, of natural gas that otherwise would be flared, um, you know, and methane that, you know, goes to the atmosphere instead if we capture it and combust all of that energy right around the world and we use it to secure a fundamentally sound monetary system, like what are the second and third order effects of such an idea? Um, and like, you know, there's only probably a couple hundred thousand people on the small corner of the internet that have actually pondered that idea um, at a deep level. So like, that's really exciting. And like the, the, the consequences are profound. Um, and we obviously don't really know what the what the result of all that is. So yeah, I'm I'm super super bullish and super optimistic. Uh, but also, I think like you know maybe the first half of the conversation or like the subsets of the conversation where we're talking about collapse or maybe these more doomy scenarios are are not a result of Bitcoin. Um, it's it's a result of you know decades centuries of humans central planning. Uh, you know, the, the tides of history and, um, the result of, you know, this, um, this desire by humans to be, to be free in this kind of emergent system, um, while others attempt to control them and coerce them. And so this, this liberating technology kind of coming from nothing, coming from zero, coming from this guy in his basement that released this open source code that no one knows who he is is what I've said multiple times is like the most powerful idea of our time. Um, and it's why I'm all in on it. It's like, if Bitcoin fails, then like we have bigger problems. So like, I, I should just go all in because like, and not like, all, like I'm not, and not to say all in is in like everybody listening, put all your money in Bitcoin and don't think twice, but more so like when you really go think through it all, you think through like where this all is headed, the world, technology, politics, freedom, censorship, and you ponder that and you think, okay, well, if there's a world that this freedom technology, this open neutral network, 
can exist or doesn't exist, or for some reason that I haven't thought through fails, what does that world look like? Like if this fails, if this idea fails and whatever, you know, quantify or qualify fair failure as whatever you want it to be. But if it fails, then like we're screwed anyway. <laughs> like, so like I, it, for me then like logically, like I, I must, you know, wholly go all in because there's no other alternative. Um, so yeah, so I think about it. Yeah, it's a good it's a good sort of thing to to take this conversation in a uh, in a more optimistic way uh because like for all the doom and gloom here I'm insanely optimistic about this thing like not only bitcoin but but all the t- like being able to have a zoom call with you on the other side of the atlantic I find that absolutely fascinating like whenever I'm in a <laughs> whenever I'm in a plane I I am absolutely in awe of the fact that we built something that can fly like People, people don't appreciate these things. Uh, we take them for granted, but like, of course we got this. We can communicate with whomever we want anywhere on the planet by the click of a button and we can send the money frictionless and anonymous, uh, and uncensorable, uh, uncensorable, uh, anywhere to anyone. So of course we got this We like, we got here because the, because of the free market and like, we didn't get here because of these coercive institutions or democracy or anything we got here despite that so so like being anything but optimistic is is just playing the game that they want you to play they want you to be fearful and by they i mean all the assholes of the world like uh so <laughs> yeah anyway uh, dylan i think it's been an absolute pleasure having you on and talking to you about this and that uh so before before we let you go like where is there anywhere you want to uh uh direct our listeners uh where can we find you online and where can we find your stuff and anything else in general yeah no i uh, appreciate you having me on this has been a blast um took it in a whole bunch of different uh places uh yeah you can just find me on twitter at dylan leclerc um underscore doing a whole bunch of bitcoin stuff um i post some notes too i'm not even sure how to hand that off to no sir but I need to post more, admittedly. Um, but yeah, no, this has been great. Uh, it's cool seeing you guys a couple times at the EU conferences. I think new. I, I think I saw you at Amsterdam too. I, I'm not. Mistaken. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, no, this is it's great. It's awesome that we get to talk. You know, x thousand miles away about this freedom, uh, this freedom technology, this orange coin. Uh, and yeah, I'm super bullish. Um, super bullish on Bitcoin. Uh, I think the the spectrum or the array of how this can all happen, um, you know, both extremely quickly, uh, faster than any of us can can comprehend or fathom, um, is a very very uh, real possibility. Um, but likewise, you know, who knows? Maybe it takes longer than we expect, and we're just uh, on this super small corner of the internet where we're very much obsessed with the thing, and we're right. But it takes. Uh, takes a long time or longer than maybe we'd want for other people to, to come along and understand. And I think that's okay too. Uh, freedom technology should pour in and everybody that needs to understand it will at some point. So yeah, super Absolutely. bullish on the future. Uh, just a, qu- a quick question there. Are you coming to Madeira by any chance to uh, Bitcoin Atlantis? I am planning on it. Yes. Uh, yeah, great. Am. Great. Then we'll see each other soon. Looking forward to that one. Good guys. This is fun. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Dylan. This has been the Freedom Footprint Show. Thanks for listening.